When it became evident that a railroad system would be a huge benefit to this country, laying still a line that stretched across the entire United States became a major priority. And not only was the goal to lay track, but it was to do so as quickly as possible. And amazingly enough, this goal was accomplished in just 75 years. Now, I realize that 75 years sounds like a long time to most of us. After all, we live in an age in which seismic technological shifts seem to occur every 30 minutes. But laying steel track that covered the entire terrain that stretched from New York to San Francisco in that short time period was nothing short of remarkable. You ask, how exactly do those rail workers pull it off? Well, one of their major reasons for their success was a complete disregard for anything that stood in their way. They absolutely refused to be slowed down. In so many ways, the spirit of determination was good, but at the same time, there was an ugly side to it as well. For instance, many of these rail workers, they were willing to do whatever it took to make sure they secured the land that was necessary for a railroad didn't matter who owned it. Now, in most cases, they didn't just take the land outright, but at the same time, they certainly didn't treat people right. And so by 1870, you had a new word in the American vernacular to describe someone who had been treated unjustly. You've been railroaded. Now, there are a lot of terms from the 1870s that we no longer use. A uh, term like lally cooler. That's to describe a real success. Or some pumpkins. That describes a really big deal. Or you got Chicagoed. That describes being beaten down in a competition. We don't use those phrases anymore. But railroaded? That one's stuck, right? We know that term very well. And not only that, Most of us have shared that experience. Okay, we haven't been done wrong by Amtrak, right? But at some point in time, there was a boss or a family member. There was a teacher. There was a coach. There was a business partner. There was a judge who did us wrong. And if you've never had that experience in life, don't worry. Someday you will. Because in a world with competing agendas, it is only a matter of time before each and every person gets railroaded in one way or another. And if you've ever been railroaded in your life, I think you'll agree with me when I say it is the worst. Now, I have no doubt that many of you here this morning could share some pretty horrific stories of being railroaded at some point in time in your life. But the most egregious railroad job that's ever taken place in the history of humanity occurred some 2,000 years ago in the city of Jerusalem. Being Passover week, the city was full of locals and also visitors who were in the most festive of spirits. This was a week in which everybody was geared up to celebrate the faithfulness of God. But those who should have been leading the celebration were in no mood to celebrate. And why was that? Well, for this entire week, there was this no-name come from this know-nothing town who had been a major pain in their backside. Actually, he had been a source of irritation for a lot longer than that, but this was especially true this week. He had gotten under their skin. You see, for this entire week, he took every opportunity to correct their theology and chastise their ideology. And he even went so far as to kind of pull back the curtain on their less than honest ways. The religious leaders finally figured out or came to the conclusion, if we don't do something about this guy very, very soon, we're in danger of losing it all. We're in danger of losing power and prestige and influence. And so they decided we need to do something. And so what did they do? You know what they did. They found an insider they could bribe to betray him. They arrested him under false pretenses. And then they brought trumped up charges to the Roman authorities to try to get buy-in from them. And what exactly were the charges that were brought against Jesus? 
Well, listen to the words of the gospel writer Luke in Luke chapter 23 and verse 1 and 2. Then the entire council took Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor. They began to state their case. This man has been leading our people away by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. Now, those were charges that were quick to get the attention of Pilate. If it was true that Jesus had been telling people, you don't need to pay your taxes, and at the same time saying, you know what, I'm a king, then he needed to be dealt with swiftly and severely. After all, one of the primary duties on Pilate's job description was this, you keep down any potential political uprising. That's job one. But here's the question, were the charges true? Well, the first charge was a blatant lie, right? In no time did Jesus ever tell people, hey, don't worry about your taxes, you don't really need to pay those. In fact, it was just the opposite. When he was questioned about his views on paying taxes, this is what he said, you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. That was his answer. Second charge, there was an element of truth to it. Jesus did say, I am a king and I am the king of the Jews. But at the same time, he made it very clear that I don't have any interest in an earthly throne. In fact, by the time he had the opportunity to have a conversation with Pilate, he made it very, very clear, I'm not up for a power struggle with Caesar, not interested in it at all. In fact, his words were these, John chapter 18, verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Religious leaders, they got it. They could see right through this, or I'm sorry, Pilate could see right through the religious leaders. He knew Jesus was being railroaded. And and so he was quick to declare him innocent. He said this in verse 4, chapter 23 of Luke. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But here's what Pilate feared. He feared that I'm making a political mistake that this could all come back to bite me in some way if they get upset and they lead some kind of revolt and there's turmoil within this city. And I don't need that right now in my particular point in my career. And so he passed the buck. He said, here's where you're going next. You're going to go to a ruler of the Jews. You're going to go see Herod. And Herod up to this point considered Pilate to be a bitter enemy. But he was absolutely thrilled to have the opportunity to weigh in on this particular situation. He took his time. He took the time to listen to other religious leaders bring some charges to him about Jesus. And he even went to the extra effort and he had a conversation with Jesus. And after doing all that due diligence, he came to this conclusion. Jesus is a joke. He's a joke. But, but he is not a threat. And so you had two different leaders, one Roman, one Jewish, who came to the exact same conclusion, that Jesus is not leading a political uprising. And the whole matter should have been over and done with right there. But the religious leaders were resolute in their determination not to allow anyone or anything stand in their way. And so they said to the political lead, or to the yes, political leaders, hey, we've got an offer for you. Barabbas in exchange for Jesus. And then the shouts started, the chants, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And not once, not twice, but three times, Pilate came back and said, you know what this? This guy's not guilty of committing any type of crime. He does not deserve to die. They wouldn't hear of it. They didn't care. So they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And as often as the case, those who are in a position to stop a railroad job from going down did not have the backbone to make it stop. And so we read these words in Luke 23 and verse 24. Pilate decided to grant their demand. What happened next makes the stomach turn. 
horrific beating with a bone entangled whip, a crown of thorns crammed onto his head. Spit in the eye, a smack to the face, nails in his hands and his feet. Chants and jeers, cries and tears, a slow, slow suffocation, and a final breath. Railroaded. That's what it looks like at its very worst. And as we reflect upon that horrific Friday that Jesus experienced, there are a couple of truths that we can take with us to be able to remember in those moments when we find ourselves being treated unjustly. The very first truth is simply this. When you're being railroaded, remember that God is still in control. In many ways, it appeared that the religious leaders were pulling the strings, especially in their manipulation of Pilate on this particular Friday. But the truth is, the reality is that every single thing that went down went down according to God's plan. Long before, God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, they came up with this plan. They put this plan in motion the moment that Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden fruit. Praise be to God the Father that he said, you know what, you can have my son, I'll send my son. Praise be to the son who said, I'll stand in their place. And whose place did he stand in? Well, he stood in the place of Barabbas. If anybody deserved to die that day, it was certainly Barabbas. Luke tells us in verse 25 of Luke chapter 23, he released the man who had been thrown into the prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Barnabas got a new lease on life on that day, but was he the only one? Of course not. The railroad job that was done to Jesus, it also set us free as well. And as you know, we've been set free now from the power of sin and death so that we might live in a flourishing relationship with God. The author of Hebrews writes about it in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5 through 7, then verse 10 and 15 through 18. He says, therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. And then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I've come to do your will, my God. Verse 10, and by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 15, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts. I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. What appeared to be a plan hatched by evil man was actually a gift of love and grace given to us by our loving and gracious Father. And even in the midst of this railroad job, God was still in control. He is always in control of your life. Am I suggesting that every time you are railroaded that that's part of God's plan? I'm not. I'm not suggesting that. I mean, who knows? It may be, it may not be, only he knows about that. I I don't pretend to to try to answer that question. What I'm saying is, is this, is that God, who is always in control, is always faithful to work for your good. We go back to those wonderful and uh, well-known words of Paul in Romans chapter 8, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. How can good come out of a railroad job? You ever find yourself asking that question, especially when you're in the midst of it? What good can possibly come out of this? I'll give you one example of good. I've got a buddy who will tell you that if it was not for him being railroaded by his past employer, he wouldn't be in the great position career-wise that he's in today. Now, I imagine many of you could share similar stories like that and testimonies. That's one of the ways that God works for our good. Oftentimes, he works through these difficult, unjust circumstances, trying situations to prove our circumstances. 
But more often, though, he uses those trying circumstances to improve us. Oftentimes, we read Romans chapter 8, 28, but we don't go on to Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. I think the two are very important to come together because in Romans chapter 8 and, 28, 8 and verse 29, we are reminded by Paul that God's great desire is for us to become just like Jesus. He says this, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. It, it's hard not to wallow in self-pity when you're being railroaded, isn't it? To ask, why is this happening to me? I don't deserve it. But perhaps a better use of our time would begin to question, what is it that God really wants me to learn in this experience? What is he trying to form in me? What lifestyle changes might he be directing me to make? There's nothing fun about being railroaded. But you can be certain that God won't waste those experiences He'll use every single one of those experiences to accomplish his will in you and for you and or for the world. Not only must we remember that God is in control, but we must do our very best to stay in control. And if there's ever a moment when you're tempted to lose your Christianity, it's when you're being treated unjustly, isn't it? It's in those moments there's a part of us that wants to to seek revenge or at the very least to just verbally blast the other person, right? Many, many years ago, a a good friend of mine, he decided when he saw what he believed me being treated in an unjust way that he would take revenge for me. And so this is what he did. He went to the grocery store, went to the magazine aisle. You know that aisle and there's just all kinds of magazines. And he got out from each magazine a subscription card, pulled out a stack, had a stack of subscription cards, went home, and he filled those out with the name and the address of the person he thought who had messed me over. (laughs) Yeah, you say, oh, no, I have to admit to you, I still get a little bit of pleasure and a warm feeling (laughs) when I think about that guy opening up his mailbox and finding Better Homes and Garden and Bridal Weekly and... You know, things like that. Because it seems like to us in many ways that to fight fire with fire, to sling mud when it's slung at you is the right way to go. But we must not. We shouldn't because because Jesus didn't. Not once in the midst of being railroaded did Jesus whine and gripe about what was being done to him. He didn't take the opportunity to let the people who are standing there at the foot of the cross who were responsible for this just to hear a piece of his mind. He didn't even call for revenge on those dirty, rotten, nasty religious leaders who had been so unethical. None of that. I'm not saying that you should never stand up for yourself. But what I'm saying is simply this, is that we must make sure that when we do, We do so in a way that honors God. Responding in a righteous way when one is being treated unjustly, it can cause other believers to turn to Jesus. And this is what happened on that horrific Friday when Jesus was railroaded. Seeing all that happened to Jesus, including how Jesus responded, it changed the heart of at least one centurion. Verse 47 of Luke 23, the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. And he was not the only one who was convicted by the righteousness of Christ on that day. There was also a criminal who made a confession of faith. Verse 39 through 42, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the the, uh, other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. If Jesus would have responded in kind, if Jesus would have done similar to what they had done to him, there's a good chance that these types of conversions, confessions, never would have taken place. But he held his integrity. And so must we. And and Jesus not only kept his cool, but he gave his offenders what they needed most. And what was that? It's forgiveness. Verse 34. 
Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Keeping your cool is one thing, but forgiving those who have railroaded you, that's a little much, isn't it? And when I think about the two or three major times in my life when I feel like I've been railroaded, I'm not sure I'm up for the task at times to actually forgive. It seems like too much. And I imagine for some of you that are here this morning, it seems like too much. Not after what's been done to you. But I'd say to us, we can do it. And I believe that because other people just like us have done it. One of the most powerful examples of a person choosing to forgive, modern day examples, is a woman, Immaculate Illibiguzzi. I'm not sure I pronounced her name right, last name. I had the opportunity to hear Immaculate share her testimony at a Willow Creek a Leadership Conference a few years ago. Just quickly to paraphrase her story, many of you probably know it, 1994, when the genocide was taking place in Rwanda, Immaculate gathered with a few other women in a very small bathroom in her pastor's home. All around that house were Hutus who were wielding machetes in hunt of them. Now, during that time, most of her family members and her fellow Tutsi people, they were absolutely slaughtered. And the grief was overwhelming. But Immaculate made the decision, before I leave this bathroom, I am going to choose to forgive rather than seek revenge, and I will not live my life in bitterness. How did she do it? I want you to listen to her words that she shares in her book, Left to Tell. I prayed continually for weeks, and my relationship with God was deeper than I'd ever imagined possible. I felt like the daughter of the kindest, most powerful king the world had ever known. I surrendered my thoughts to God every day when I retreated to the special place in my heart to commune with him in the midst of the genocide. I just, I want to make sure you understand, this is all going on while she's still in that tiny little bathroom and they're having to be as quiet as they can possibly be. I found my salvation. I knew that my bond with God would transcend the bathroom, the war, and the Holocaust. It was a bond I now knew would transcend my life as well. I lifted my heart to the Lord, and he filled it with his love and forgiveness. For years now, some of us have been living a life of self-pity and bitterness and hatred because of something that somebody has done to us, a family member, a boss, coach, a teacher, a church member, society at large. What happened to you was wrong. It never should have happened. But the reality is you can't change it. The only thing that we can change is our response to it. And so I want to encourage you. I want to plead with you to begin to pray that God will fill your heart with grace, that he'll fill your heart with love, that he'll fill your heart with forgiveness. I'm absolutely confident that God can do that. He'll hear that prayer. He will do that. And that he will transform your railroad story from one that elicits sympathy to one that actually changes lives. And really, that's my prayer this morning for each and every one of us, starting with myself. That God changes these stories. He changes railroad stories into God stories that points people to the one who hung on a cross so that we might be set free from sin and death 
and from bitterness and hate. And I don't pretend to suggest that this is easy work. In fact, it's impossible work on our own, but it is God's work. And we want to be there for each other to help each other to get to that place and that space. And so if there's anything that we can do for you today, just to be with you in your pain, to love you, to pray with you, to listen, we would be honored to do so. And if you're struggling with some of these feelings and these emotions that it's brought up, stories from the past that you're still really struggling with, the last thing I want this morning is for you to walk away feeling guilty. It's not about guilt at all. I simply want you to know that there is a God who is so powerful that he loves you, he's still working in your life, and he can bring you to a point of true freedom if you'll lean into him.